to engage with bold ideas, varied approaches, and forward thinking that make Princeton the special place that it is. We want to hear from you throughout a year of forward thinking, and particularly during Forward Fest. Be sure to tag any of your forward thinking posts on social media with hashtag Princeton forward. That includes any questions or comments you want to share with the Princetonians who will be broadcast today. Our focus is on some of our alumni forward thinkers. This season highlights exploration. I'm delighted to introduce to you Julia Borstein, my classmate in the great Princeton class of 2000. Julia is the Senior Media and Entertainment Correspondent at CNBC and will be expertly guiding our conversation today. All yours, Julia. Thanks, Juan, and welcome to Princeton University's Forward Fest. In today's session, Thinking Forward Exploration, my name is Julia Borston. I'm a member of the great Princeton class of 2000, and I'm so delighted to be with you on this Saturday. I am looking forward to digging into the idea of exploration today. So many different ways exploration can be valuable right now. And I'm so lucky to be joined by four remarkable forward thinkers in this area who are all Princeton alumni. With us today are Micah Burkhart, professional climber, conservation entrepreneur, author and filmmaker, and member of the Princeton class of 1998. We're also joined by Karen Roder Davis, director of early stage projects at X, that's the Moonshot Factory and member of the Princeton class of 1994. We also have with us Richard Preston. He's author and a communicator on science and the environment. He's a member of the Princeton graduate class of 1983. And last but not least, we have Roy Swan, director of mission investments at the Ford Foundation and member of the Princeton class of 1986. I'm so excited to have all four of them here today. We're gonna to speak to each of them separately and then bring them all together for a conversation at the end. And for that, we invite you to submit your questions. But I wanna start now by welcoming Karen Roder Davis to the discussion. Um, Karen, you are such a perfect person to have here to talk about exploration because your job is literally to explore moonshots. Tell us a little bit about what you do at X and how you explore the ideas to figure out if they even could be a moonshot. Excellent. Uh, thank you so much. And thanks to Princeton for having me. This is, uh, like you said, a, a topic that is so close to me, both on an individual level and then what we can do at an organizational level. Uh, so yes, I work at a moonshot factory. And if you unpack that to figure out you know, what that actually means, moonshot refers to that 1969 la moon landing where it was seemingly impossible. And how are we going to actually achieve this amazing goal? Uh, factory is how do you make that process repeatable when you're trying to tackle different missions that are so bespoke? And so that's our own goal and what we strive for. Uh, so the way we think about it is we try to find projects that are at the intersection of three different things. One is a really big problem. And this is a problem that affects millions, if not billions of people. It's uh, top of mind critical. And then we try to think about what is a radical solution? What is something that's not just incremental, but could really absolutely transform that problem and deliver that impact that we're looking for? And then because we are a technology company and that's in our DNA, how could we solve that problem with some breakthrough technology? So for an example, if you thought about Waymo, which is one of our self-driving cars uh, uh, projects, it's one of our most well-known, the big problem is so many uh, deaths and injuries occur because of human error uh, in, in driving, not to mention all of the environmental issues, the congestion and so forth. So what if we removed the driver? What if we made that car remove the steering wheel? And so after a lot of machinations and uh, software, sensors, systems, services, we are moving toward that goal and it's a reality as, as we test in several areas of the country right now. 
So to me, what seems so daunting is you want to solve these massive problems. You want to solve something that's going to have a huge impact 10, 20 years down the line. But to identify the specific thing that you could build, whether it's a product or a service, something that you could do right now that's going to have that, that long-term ripple effect, how do you identify, how do you explore the options to even identify what those projects are going to be? Yeah, it's a really... Um difficult process, but it's also a really fun process. I think you almost have to be childlike in your approach. So it's um, first just imagining the future that you want. We're all sitting in a room and we're focusing on, again, what are the big issues today and what could it look like? What would it feel like? And then you constantly are peeling back that. What could we create? What would make sense? And we stay in that brainstorm creative mode for as wacky mode for as long as possible and then say okay how would we actually do that what would move the needle and sometimes some of these projects we're iterating on for months years and they're not working um, and we try to do it though as quickly as possible and focus on the most difficult thing possible uh, to make sure that breakthrough happens to then move it forward. So I think this idea of exploring and having the freedom to tackle the most difficult thing seems like a really crucial part of it. Tell me about your Smarty Pants project, because I think that captures the exploration and the approach. Sure. So Smarty Pants, the goal of Smarty Pants is the big problem is, is mobility. We have a, a, a growing older population. We have a lot of mobility issues within the, our, our world and it impacts uh, a quality of life for, for so many people and their ability to uh, earn a living um, and live comfortably and so forth. And so the big idea was, well, what if we could create clothing that was uh, comfortable and uh, but had an exoskeleton built into it and a really lightweight exoskeleton to enable uh, that mobility, that assistance. And so um, what goes into that? It's again, software, it's sensors, it's computation, it's fabrics. Um, you assemble a, a diverse team to get together to work, work it through. And your first prototype is ugly. It's literally duct tape and chewing gum and you, you attach it to your legs and it's clunky. Um, and you're doing the best you can uh, just to make sure that could this could this actually work? Then you say, all right, how could we make this better? How could we keep improving on it? Um, and so it's trial and error, but, um, and with the realization that it might not work, we still might, you might not see it a year from now, but uh, it, they're doing amazing things on it right now. It's really exciting to watch. Smarty Pants, I suggest everyone look up some articles on it. It's so interesting and exciting to see that potential. It seems like the core of what you do is really contingent on having a culture that encourages and enables exploration among your team. How do you foster that community of, that, that celebrates exploration and also make it a safe space for your team to explore? Yes, I think that's one of the most important things that we're constantly striving for. I think um, the ability to be wrong, the ability to try to take smart risks at the individual level and the team level, and the ability to celebrate failure is important. We actually will give bonuses to teams that decide to kill their projects because they're not working. Um, and we celebrate even the, you know, the tiniest victory as well as you know, what we learned uh, because some of these projects get put on the shelf and then they become incredibly relevant uh, later on when we try to solve different issues. If you look at the original Moonshot, for example, so many amazing technologies came out of that that are crucial to life today, apart from landing on the moon. You think about um, insulation, our breathing masks now, uh, cordless devices, water purification. So all of that exploration and that uh, is never in vain. And we really try to celebrate the attempts. Also the idea that, that true exploration is impossible without a certain amount of failure. Um, tell me how you work, because I think that everyone watching right now wants to have more freedom to explore within their, their workplaces or even their, with their kids at their homes. How do you 
tell your employees that this is how you you should should think about exploration. This is how you should feel free to fail. Um, I know there was an analogy about about teaching uh, teaching an animal Shakespeare, and I think that's a that might be a perfect one. Yes, that's uh, we use that a lot around the building. Um, it's if you're trying to uh, teach a monkey to recite Shakespeare standing on a pedestal, where do you start? And it could be very tempting and oftentimes very satisfying to start with a pedestal. You build this beautiful pedestal, you can show your boss you made progress and, and the dollars were well spent and that's terrific. But at the end of the day, have you made anything new? No, you've just replicated something that already existed start with the hardest problem first, which is teaching the monkey to recite Shakespeare. And if that, if your first attempt doesn't work, try it again. What else could you do? What else could you do? Um, and so we continue to iterate, we continue to celebrate, and we're constantly asking each other, now what's the hardest part of the problem? And we're continuing to de-risk as quickly as possible. And, and by going to the hardest part first, you, you save all of that time. Um, exactly. So interesting. I could definitely talk to each one of you all day, but we're going to leave it here, Karen, and we'll bring you back um, in a bit. Next up, we are going to talk with Micah Burkhart. But first, let's take a look back at another alum explorer, Princeton's man on the moon, astronaut Pete Conrad, and then we'll be right back. Pete Conrad was the third person to walk on the moon and the only Princetonian that was able to, that walked on the moon. I have uh, a number of really interesting documents about uh, Pete from the time that he was here at Princeton, including some letters after he left Princeton, which are really quite interesting. Uh, Dave Hazen, Professor Hazen, became close friends with, uh, with uh, Pete Conrad. And there are letters back and forth between them. The first letter that we have was a few months after Pete graduated Princeton. So I believe it was dated, uh, I think it was uh, November 1953. And he's talking about his fellow uh, pilots. He says, most of them are at mid-air school, formation, where I am now. Formation is fun. Actually, the closer you fly, the easier it is to see the relative motion. Many Princetonians know that there is a flag that went to the moon, the Princeton flag. In our records, we have the letters back and forth from uh, between Pete Conrad and Freddie Fox, who's Princeton's historian. And it tells the story about how the flags got to Pete Conrad for him to take to the moon. Dear Pete, don't worry. Uh, we will have the Princeton flags, 12 inch by 18 inch, in your hands by the middle of next month. So this is September, so it's the middle of uh, October. If I have to, and he says, if I have to bring them to Houston myself on my bicycle. And then the, the last really interesting item in our records is that after he had walked on the moon, uh, our department asked Pete to give a, uh, our honorific uh, lecture. He declined indirectly through his boss. His boss was Alan Shepard. Uh, Alan Shepard was the first American in space on the Mercury mission. And this uh, very respectful letter comes back saying regretfully uh, because of uh, NASA's tight uh, training uh, schedule that uh, Pete would have to decline. A set of uh, records that we have in the department and it's one that I hope to have preserved at our manuscript library so that it's not just in my personal files, my, our departmental files, but it actually gets uh, saved uh, in perpetuity. We're back now with Micah Burhart, with whom I was so lucky to have a chance to, to interview in a breakfast conversation at the last She Roars conference, which was at Princeton in person, which makes me um, very nostalgic for those in-person interviews. Um, I'm so pleased to be sharing your success and your leadership as an entrepreneur in the climate and conservation space with a much wider audience. Welcome, Micah. It's great to be here. Thanks, Julia. Um, so, Micah, what's so interesting to you and your connection to exploration is that it started with the exploration of the physical world, literally scaling mountains, and then it, it segued and that led you to the exploration of how you could help communities and also um, preserve the environment. And all of those th three things are so intimately intertwined. Um, but first, tell us how you became an expert climber and what led you to that, to that challenge and to exploring um, the, the world and parts of the world so far away from where we are right now. 
I loved being outside when I was growing up. I grew up in Minnesota and it's the thing that made the most sense to me. And so, you know, like any kid, I would just toss myself into the thing that gave me the most joy. And that went from ski racing to canoeing, to backpacking, to climbing, to by the time I was at Princeton, I was sort of having a bifurcated existence between really wanting to be at Princeton and study and really wanting to be climbing around the world. So I attempted to amalgamate the two of them, which also included a year off to climb full time while I was at school. Um, and I even started working as a uh, guide and shortly after graduating as a professional climber. And so how did that lead you to discovering your passion for using your time spent on these mountains to raise awareness uh, and, and raise money and become an entrepreneur in this space to help the people in those communities and also that environment that they were living in? Yeah, for me, you can't climb with blinders on when you start climbing around the world. You might be able to do it in the U.S. where you can go climbing in, um, you know, outside of Moab. Or you can climb in Yosemite and you can say it's just me and the natural environment. But if you start climbing around the world, it's you, the natural environment and all the people who live there. <laughs> and so if you can't find a way to make all of that work, then it's going to be uncomfortable for you. And I started becoming really curious about how my life as a climber traveling around the world could actually help have better global understanding for the people who are living in these other places. And ultimately that landed me on a mountain in Mozambique called Mount Namuli. And, you know, I went there as a climber to bring scientists with me to do a bunch of scientific exploration on vertical faces that had never um, seen scientific exploration before, and then launch a program with a local residents who lived at the base of Mount Namuli, which happens to be one of the most amazing biodiversity hotspots in the world. And for me as a climber, you know, when you're a climber, you bring everything you can to bear on what you're trying to pull off, right? There are very few rules. You're just like, what, you know, what skill sets, how scrappy do I need to be? How tenacious do I need to be to make this happen? And then that's the attitude that I brought into the work um, and the organization, which I ultimately founded, which is called Legato. So tell us about that organization and tell us about how it bridges these worlds um, it, it's, re it's really impressive to also see how you took your own ambition to push yourself physically as a climber and are now pushing yourself to do everything it takes to help both the community and the environment. Yeah, for me, you know, as a climber and as someone who'd spent time, um, I would say, in the environmental lane, it was really easy to start the work that we did um, with the communities around Mount Namuli as a conservationist. It's like, all right, that's the most natural fit. I'll step into this lane for a little bit. But I realized that that wasn't a really comfortable place for me to be because conservation effectively can also act like its own set of blinders. And in order to really work with people who lived in some of the most remote, hard to access places in one of the poorest um, you know, kind of poorest regions and one of the poorest countries in the world, you can't say, hey, so about that really great frog that lives in those trees, let's only, let's only talk about that. Everyone wants to talk about all of their needs. And it became really clear to me that I didn't want to only occupy the conservation lane. And in fact, if we did, we were going to be dead in the water. So how could we actually create change? How could we do it with the local communities that we're working in? And because I didn't come from this entrenched background um, of kind of being in a single sector, and instead my background is running expeditions all over the world. Um, and I, as I was saying, amalgamating different skill sets, I said, okay, great. Let's hear what you need. Let's talk about what we need. And let's see if there's a way that we can work together toward what we now call a thriving future. So it was this way to, to pivot and to not go lane to lane, but to be more inclusive with everybody and say, let's see if we can all get our needs met and actually move this place forward so that you can not only get the, the life that you need, but you're also protecting this resource for yourselves and for the world. And it seems to me like your ability to explore new options and of the fresh set of eyes you brought to the idea of social entrepreneurship um, enabled you to find different solutions than maybe had existed before. Definitely. And it's about not being afraid to try those different solutions. And now, you know, we started in the mountains and we really thought in the beginning, that's where we were going to expand to. And instead we're expanding to the grasslands of Botswana, in addition to the mountains in Kenya, in addition to a coastal area in Chile, because this way that we've developed to work with groups to define their legacy, to lead on that legacy toward a thriving future, that isn't something that's unique to the mountains. We had to develop in, in the mountains and be scrappy and make it happen. But now it's pushing ourselves to go bigger and to say, look, you know, writ large, we need to come out of siloed thinking to solve 
to, to basically have some of these places that have the remnants of the most amazing global biodiversity to have them succeed and carry forward and actually be the leaders for progressive action on this. And ultimately that's gonna come down to those local communities and Legato exists to support the local communities to lead on it themselves, be it on a mountain or anywhere. And so how important in that relationship is you, is, is your taking on the role of saying, I, here's my expertise, but we're ultimately gonna make this about your, your decisions your community, your expertise, how do you balance your, what you have learned as an explorer with yep. the needs of the local community and make sure that you can come together and really learn from each other? Yeah, so we do that through a process that we call radical communication. And that was built a bit on um, an amazing group called Health and Harmony that does radical listening. And we said, yeah, like, we have to be truly where we are and say, here are these things that we've learned from working in Ethiopia, from working in Mozambique. This is what's been good for us. Do you want to work with us and partner with us as we go, go forward? Would you like to try this idea? Not, we have it all figured out. This is how it's going to go A to Z, but more, here's, here's what we believe in. Do you want to be our partner? And then in turn, radically listening to the groups that we're working with about what they need, and then having this really pragmatic conversation, which this can sound really odd, obvious, but this isn't really the way it happens in the conservation world and the development world. It's like, let's get pragmatic here. Are we a good fit? Are we good partners? Can we actually move forward and find a way to success together? And so that's how we do it. It is, it's more of a blending versus a, versus a top-down mandate that this is the program that we're going to do. Are you in or are you out? It's, can we build something together? I'm really curious how you as an explorer yourself, you as someone who really defined yourself for so many years of your life as someone who was a risk taker, going to new unfamiliar situations, trying new things, pushing yourself, how that's impacted you now as a leader of this organization and how you think that's shaped your worldview. Yeah, it shapes every, I was listening to your interview with Karen, it shapes everything we do all the time because we're constantly pushing at the edge of what's possible. And there's, we don't have anything in our collective DNA that says we have to sit over here in this corner of the room. We're saying the, like the entire field is open. What do we need? What are the best practices that come from this that we can bring to bear here? Where did we fail? Okay, great. Let's go grab something different. So it's the ethos. It's the culture of doing that um, from my life running expeditions, um, from my life now being the mother of twins, which is sort of like its own ongoing expedition um, and, and doing these things and bringing that energy to my team and bringing people to my team who can help drive us for that. So to, to, so to be at the forefront and to be practical um, and to combine this all towards radical success. Are there certain things that you feel like you learned from your career as a climber um, and an uh, explorer of that physical world that you want your team and other people to be able to, to learn even without that extreme experience of, of scaling mountains? Yeah, I, one of the biggest things is that if you really want something, it usually takes giving it 200%. And there's, there's kind of no other way around it. If something is big and bold and scary and possibly dangerous and you could die or whatever, whatever is the um, combination of risks that are there, you're going to have to really, really try. It's going to hurt. It's going to feel good. It's going to be awkward. It's going to have all of that. And when you have all of those emotions jumbled upon each other, you're probably on the right track. I, that, that seems like a good explanation of why you have the perfect, uh, the perfect skill set for leadership. And I hope those are things that the rest of us can learn um, or try to emulate even without having had the experience of scaling, scaling mountains. Um, Micah, we're going to have to leave it there for now, but, but we will bring you back shortly. Um, fascinating stuff. And next up, we will speak about a different kind of physical and societal exploration in the public health realm with Richard Preston. Um, but before that, we will hear how a Princeton undergraduate's own exploration for medical solution became much more than just an academic exercise. <music> I met Miles, he came to me with a very important problem. At birth, I was diagnosed with severe hemophilia, which is my blood doesn't clot correctly. Now, I've been very lucky where I haven't had very many issues with hemophilia itself. However, I have had a lot of issues associated with the mode of giving myself these intravenous injections. We're trying to build a device that's at least 95% accurate, putting a needle into a vein. It's actually very difficult for even a trained person to look at your arm and be able to identify where a vein is. 
Currently, this is very expensive and prone to infection, and it's very painful. Craig and I both co-founded Invictus Technologies, which is the startup that is helping develop this technology. The real challenge was making it small enough so that we can simply strap it to your arm. You literally have it on your arm like this, clip a needle into that little white clip. The first component is a system that allows you to detect where the vein is. It will scan back and forth like this, stop above one of your veins and then go down into the vein. From there, somebody can inject their medication. They can extract blood. They can do this all without the need for a trained medical professional. From doctors and hospitals to military medics on the battlefield to phlebotomists and blood labs to humanitarian aid workers in disaster relief situations. There's a million different ways that we could go. In order to develop a technology that's really gonna help people, there's a lot of very important steps that have to be undertaken. And we're very grateful to the support that we received from Princeton University. Specifically the Keller Center has been super helpful. One of the most valuable things was doing those customer surveys, finding out just how interested they were in this technology. After we go through FDA approval, we'll be able to get this device out on the market and give it to millions of people to change their lives. It's exciting to know that what you're doing can make a real difference. I'm so excited to welcome author uh, of books and articles, many, many uh, different books of different types, of it, I, which I read and admire so much. Um, a, an expert writer on science and the environment, Richard Preston. Thank you so much for joining us today. Um, it's really an honor as a writer myself. Um, we both took the John McPhee class at Princeton. Um, so I, I, for that, I am very grateful and, and so grateful to have you here. The thing about your writing that strikes me is that you like to write about explorers, people who are exploring um, diseases like and, and viruses like Ebola, people who are exploring um, the, the forest canopy. And in doing so, you also explore what is inside these people's heads. Tell me how you think about writing about your subjects and how you think about getting inside what they're really thinking. Well, I've dedicated myself to nonfiction writing for the most part, uh, which I, I learned, I learned the power of nonfiction in the John McPhee course that you took, Julia. Uh, I, it, it, it caused me to have a complete rethink about exactly what, what you're doing if you're writing. I, I'd always conceived of writing novels as being perhaps the pinnacle of literary achievement. Uh, but I uh, but I found in the McPhee course that of course there are other ways to skin a cat, and one way is to um, go deeply, dive deeply into the the reality of human lives as we experience them. Uh, and I happen to be very interested in science, and I happen to be really attracted to people who are out there exploring in one way or another worlds worlds principally worlds of nature that that we really can hardly dream of. And in doing that, uh, I also found that, you know, in the end, all writing is really about human beings. It's about us. Um, we can write about nature, but it's about our relationship with the universe. And in order to do that effectively, I, I wanted to get inside people's minds uh, to, to, to do what a novelist can do, except to bring back news of reality, the inner reality of that human existence that we all experience and yet often have difficulty uh, communicating or t telling other people about. Uh, and so uh, just to give you a, a, an example or a story, I was working on The Hot Zone. Uh, this was years ago. This is a book about the emergence of Ebola virus in a suburb of Washington, DC. And the army sent in uh, soldiers and officers to seal off a monkey house where there were 600 monkeys that were dying of Ebola Zaire, the hottest variety of Ebola. And uh, they, they ultimately went into the, the monkey house and they sealed it off. They went in wearing spacesuits and they euthanized the monkeys and took thousands of samples. And somehow or other, the Ebola never ended up spreading widely uh, outside Washington. Now, uh, 
in, you know, in getting into this story, I had a lot of difficulty getting into the army, getting anybody to talk to me. But eventually I got permission from the army to interview one of the officers on the mission, a guy named Jerry Jacks. And while I was interviewing Jerry, um, his spouse walked in, Colonel Nancy Jacks. And, you know, there are moments when I, I think uh, uh, Federico Fellini, the filmmaker said that sometimes you pull on a small tail and you find it's attached to an elephant. And I asked Nancy Jacks, okay, um, have you ever had a close call with Ebola? And she said, oh, sure, of course. You know, all of us who work with Ebola virus have, have had our Ebola moments. And then she went on to describe it, just a chilling event when she had been in the level four hot zone lab at the army at Fort Detrick. And she discovered she had a hole in her spacesuit that her spacesuit had gotten flooded with monkey blood that was radiantly hot with Ebola virus. And she had a cut on the palm of her hand. Uh, she had gotten the cut the night before opening a can of beans while she was cooking for her kids. Uh, so I just listened, uh, transfixed by this. And then later, you know, this become, you know, it became quite a scene in the book. Later, uh, I, I spent hour after hour interviewing her at her kitchen table. Uh, I asked her if I could examine her hand. I spent about 15 minutes just taking notes on her hands because hands are a window into character. They can tell you a lot. And then, you know, I found out in asking her, okay, well, what was going through your mind? You know, when you were standing in that chemical shower and you knew that you had blood inside your suit and that there, you had that cut on your hand, what were you really thinking? And it turns out that it's like the Rashomon effect. You know, people, when they're re recalling a crime, for example, mm -hmm. they, people, you know, disagree on the details. But the one thing that people are really clear about is their emotions at a time of crisis when their life is in jeopardy. And Colonel Nancy Jacks told me that she wasn't even thinking about herself. She was thinking about the fact that she hadn't paid the babysitter. And, uh, you, know, you know, who's gonna pay the babysitter if I'm in the slammer breaking with Ebola, that's the biocontainment hospital. And her husband was in Texas and she was swearing to herself about all the things that she hadn't done. Uh, and I thought that was just completely, you know, human and utterly convincing uh, and not what I would have done if I was writing. Yeah. But, and that's what's so powerful about your writing is you pull on that tail and you bring the reader inside, um, inside the emotional process, inside the brain of, of the, these people who you're interviewing and who you're writing about in a way that, you know, we think of as only being possible in novels. Um, and and as, a, as a reader, I, I appreciate that. But I also want to make sure to get a little bit about you as an explorer yourself, because I think, uh, you know, on the heels of talking to Micah about her scaling of mountains, I would be remiss if I didn't mention that you have scaled to the, to the top of the forest canopy um, as, as part of one of your books. Tell me about how your work has pushed you to be an explorer yourself to really understand um, your subjects. Well, I found out, I'm, by the way, I'm gonna have a question for Micah later. Uh, I'm looking forward to asking it. So um, I got very interested in climbing trees with specialized equipment. And I found out about these scientists on the West Coast who are climbing the world's tallest living things, the California redwoods, West Coast redwoods. And uh, uh, I had to learn uh, the techniques of extreme tall tree climbing. Uh, and some of these techniques were classified in the sense that the, uh, the scientists wouldn't tell me how to do this. And uh, they didn't want anybody climbing in their trees. They, they keep the locations of these giant trees secret. Uh, so I ended to, up- In part to protect the trees and also to protect people from injuring themselves and trying to access them, right? That's exactly right. And there's a tradition in botany that um, endangered plants, uh, you never reveal the location of endangered plants because the contact between humans and plants never typically goes well for the plant. Uh, but anyway, I, I taught myself how to use these extreme climbing techniques. And I had to tie up a, a very special lanyard called a spider lanyard with all kinds of knots and crazy stuff, carabiners in it. And then I, I visited the scientist, Steve Sillett and um, Marie Antoine. She has a delicious name. Uh, and I, I tied uh, this very complicated rig of ropes and carabiners in front of them on their living room floor. And uh, Steve Sillett said to me, well, where did you learn how to do this? And I said, well, I learned in your garage. I had gone into their garage when they weren't home and I had taken notes 
and looked very carefully at the lanyard that they had and then had one made up and trained myself. So you get up in the redwood canopy and what I found was that uh, I, I love dealing with people when they're involved unselfconsciously in the, the thing that they're most passionate about. And so I found that the only place that I could really successfully interview Steve Sillett and Marie Antoine was when they were up in the canopy doing their work. So I'm up, I'm 300 feet off the ground. I'm dangling on a rope, um, 30 stories above the ground. I can look right straight down to the ground. I'm in midair and I'm not attached to anything except this rope and I'm hanging in a harness. And Steve Sillett is next to me and he's hanging in midair and he's got complicated computer equipment and he's, he's trying to diagnose it um, because they had these trees wired up like a patient in an ICU. And while he was obsessed with this, I was taking notes with my little notebook and asking him questions and getting these beautiful answers um, in which this scientist began talking about spiritual things and, uh, and, and talking about nature as a whole and talking about what human existence was really like for him. And I got what, what, if, what in effect was a kind of aria uh, of this one scientist, but I never could have gotten that information if I hadn't taken the trouble to uh, learn how to climb these trees. Uh, before we're out of time, very briefly, I wanna ask you to sort of reflect on that and give the, the viewers here a sense of how you see the, the power of really accessing people's inner, inner selves with that exploration, with those questions, how that enables you to, um, to be empathetic and to generate empathy and understanding in a way that you wouldn't if you were just sitting on the ground describing what was going on up there. Well, it wouldn't be the same at all. Um, and for example, when I was interviewing Steve Sillett in midair, it's always followed up by intensive fact-checking interviews, typically over the phone, in which I go over all, you know, the whole thing. And I, you know, I share with my subjects what I'm actually doing, the process of writing. And I say to Steve, okay, here's what I'm describing. And I have another scene in the book. This is the book, um, The Wild Trees in which it's the first time Steve Sillett ever climbed a redwood. He was 19 years old, arrogant. He didn't have any ropes at all. And he had to jump into a redwood at 90 feet, climbed a small tree and then jumped into a big tree. And uh, his brother was with him who is a prominent ornithologist. And when I interviewed Scott, Scott told me that he was convinced that he was gonna see his brother fall to his death. But Steve then 19 year old kid, climbs this gigantic redwood and he, he finds himself in a completely lost realm of nature. And so in getting into Steve's head, as I describe him, um, I read the whole passage out loud to him. And I say to my subjects, I did this with Nancy Jacks too. Um, does this capture what was going through your head as far as you can remember? And often I'll get these little corrections. It'll be like, no, not really. And I'll say to them sometimes, okay, this is a placeholder. I'm actually mm -hmm. not sure about this. Here's what I've written. What do you think? Mm -hmm. And then I can rewrite in real time with my subject. And, you know, when people are being sincere, and I think I have a pretty good, you know, sense of when I'm hearing BS as a reporter, but when I'm not hearing BS, um, what I'm actually hearing is some kind of ground truth. Um, in which the, the subject is, is participating in the, in the act of creation or narrating a story for the whole world. And that, that's an exhilarating thing for me um, to be able to step back as a writer and, and let the voice of my subject come through um, with crystal and a, a kind of an illuminating and it, it's all as, as a reader, I could say it's it's remarkable how powerful that exploration of that inner experience is to drive empathy and also massive awareness that the, that your books have have driven of these big issues such as Ebola and also the biodiversity of the redwoods. We're going to leave it there for now, Richard. Thank you so much. And next up, we will speak with Roy Swan about again a very different type of exploration. But first, let's take a look at explorations being made at the molecular level to develop new therapeutics with Professor Yang Yang, the Shirley M. Tillam Professor of Molecular Biology. 
the modern biology is to understand life at the molecular level, to understand the many reactions that are occurring in our cells all the time. When we have a profound understanding of the disease-causing mechanism, we may be able to help develop novel therapeutics. The technology we are using is called cryogenic electron microscopy, which allows us to capture the fine details of DNA, RNA, and the proteins to atomic resolution. The key to obtain high-quality images of these tiny molecules is to make very thin layer of ice in which our samples are embedded. We were able to put them on a supporting matrix of graphene grids, but graphene is not compatible with water solutions. The UV ozone treatment developed by my postdoc Imo Han is the way to make the graphene grids water friendly. The whole procedure all of a sudden became so simple. Mm -hmm. To me, this is only a starting point. For instance, now with COVID-19, just imagine if you can visualize how the virus uses spike protein to attach to the cellular surface then you may be able to design some small molecules that can disrupt their interaction to prevent the infection. I'm so glad to welcome Roy Swan of the Ford Foundation the modern biology to this conversation. Is to Roy will help life us examine at the co level into new to understand the many reactions that are occurring so in our today. cells all the time. Roy, we have a profound us. understanding Let's start off of the by disease. Explaining a little bit about what it is that you do at the Ford Foundation and how you are in sort of inherently taking exploring new approaches to societal to societal problems. Sure. Thanks. Thanks very much. It's such a pleasure to be here. So at the Ford Foundation, uh, our work involves uh, fighting for social justice uh, and, and battling inequality. And uh, what's new about uh, my work is the Ford Foundation is exploring how can its endowment capital be used to uh, address social problems and make money at the same time. So an example, uh, let me start with context. You know, everyone who's graduated from Princeton University um, is aware of America's internal contradiction, I'll say, that's been uh, there since his birth. And that is um, the notion of freedom uh, coexisting with uh, racial oppression. And so, um, we're exploring, you know, how, how do we address that, uh, that problem in a way that also makes the endowment money? Because foundations, endowed foundations, conduct their core business, which is giving away money through grants, uh, through the power of, uh, of endowments. And we have several themes where we've selected large social problems where uh, we believe by investing capital, we can help uh, address and fix those problems and make money. Um, and, and, and when it comes to um, uh, the racial inequality piece, um, I guess what I'd say is um, some of the questions we're exploring there might be, you know, can we disrupt the pattern recognition um, in the investment process that perpetuates um, oppression against black and brown people. Uh, do ethics and morals really matter in, uh, in capitalism and investing? Um, another question we're explaining, why is it that systemic racism continues to exist with all the evidence indicating that dismantling systemic racism would actually unleash a, a, a flood of economic opportunity, profits, and not just help the black community, but help the entire nation. So those are some of the big questions we, uh, are, that are, that's behind our investment strategy. Um, and, and, um, and our hope is that uh, we will learn by doing, uh, that is learn as we go and share 
uh, uh, share the lessons with others. Sharing those best practices. But I think what's so interesting is that you came from the world of finance. And when you came to work on the endowment, it was really important to make sure that the endowment, the, the endowment's investments were not working at counter purposes to the organization itself. And that by aligning those two things, you could have massive, massive returns beyond just um, giving out, uh, you know, giving out grants. Um, so Roy, tell us a little bit about how, how you see the opportunity and in, in investing in these double or triple bottom line um, companies or, or issues as they're called. Did we lose Roy? Roy, I think you're back now. You may be muted, but you're back. Okay, don't know what happened there. <laughs> Technical difficulties. This is the world of Zoom. Um, so I was just asking, you know, to explain a little bit about how it's so crucial to identify that this is very different from a, pr a previous sort of his traditional approach of having um, the investments of a of an endowment oftentimes work in opposition to the goal of the organization. And by having the endowments um, investments be very much aligned with the interests of the Ford Foundation, you have the potential to be investing in these self sustaining. Um, self-sustaining businesses or industries that could in effect have a flywheel impact um, on, on societal change. You know, you, you, I, I can't articulate it better than, than you just did. And the, the underlying driver is uh, kind of looking at the statistics, disaggregating those statistics on, you know, who has capital uh, in America um, and, and combining that with uh, the Ford Foundation's mission, um, which is to advance um, inequality, uh, or I should say advance equality uh, and fight inequality. Uh, and, and so when you look in, in, in living in a capitalist system, and when you look at the statistics that indicate that, for example, uh, Black women from the period of 2008 to 2018 received uh, roughly a little less than 300 million of the roughly 425 billion in venture capital that had been provided over that period. So you, you divide that at 0 0.006 is the, is, is the answer. Uh, I'm sorry, it's three, six, three zeros. So things like that. And the other piece of uh, the statistic we saw uh, was that um, women and people of color combined uh, control about 1% of the 70-ish trillion in all assets under management. And when you're in a capitalist system without control of capital, that's a problem. And it's really, we see it as uh, the origin of, of significant uh, knock-on problems, inequality. And, and, and as I mentioned, there's so much evidence available today that uh, indicates the untapped potential of the American economy if we just do a better job of providing more opportunities for more people. And so in the past three years or so that you've been at the Ford Foundation, you've been exploring these issues. Tell us where you are now in terms of what are the opportunities to invest um, and not only have financial returns, but also just as important societal returns and create these, these self-sustaining um, cycles now. Well, one of the areas that we, um, we focus on where we believe there are tremendous benefits available is in the area of uh, affordable housing. And we focus on multifamily affordable rental housing. Um, the main reason for that is we see um, the sort of mass implications of, of um, I guess, concentrated um, housing, and, and they, can be, they can be positive or negative. So in the affordable housing realm, you can have kind of uh, buildings that are merely self-storage facilities for human beings, or you can have quality residents with social services and products that provide pathways to opportunity and that people are, are proud to call home. So when we invest with affordable housing uh, uh, players, developers, um, and fund managers, we, we do our best to find those fund managers that we believe uh, see the, uh, the benefits of a double bottom line, that is financial returns and positive social impact. 
And many of those buildings might have things like after school education for children, workforce development programs, access to low cost healthcare, access to healthy uh, and, and fresh foods. And we believe that the potential to help uplift all of society through smarter uh, uses of investment capital are there for the taking. Now, there have been so many studies about how companies which have an additional purpose beyond just financial returns tend to perform better. Um, and that's true across industries. Tell us a little bit about healthcare and where you see the opportunity there to, um, and where you've, you've explored the potential um, to, to bring it back to that, that uh, main topic of exploration to have those outsized returns. Right. Well, for in, in the healthcare sector, uh, much of which is, is, is services, that could fall within a category we call quality jobs. So, you know, an example is, um, you know, assisted living situations where you have healthcare professionals that might be going into the homes of the elderly or, or those who uh, need some, some assistance. Well, uh, statistics show uh, that employees who feel well cared for by their employer treat customers and clients better. And so a part of what we look at is in services uh, areas, uh, particularly where you have uh, workers who are taking care of others in a very direct way, what can those companies do to enhance the quality of life, the quality of the job of those providers which has positive knock-on effects to the clients, the patients, not only uh, potentially uh, in, in, in extending their lives, but making their quality of lives better. Uh, and, and, and we believe that quality service means that those businesses, those companies uh, will do well in selection processes, which generates additional revenues. And just a quick final question about your exploration of your next area of interest or your next area of investment. How do you figure out where you want to look next? Is it based on, I mean, maybe you, you have an overwhelming number of things on, on your agenda, but how do you figure out which is going to have the most impact and where, what is your process of research or, um, or conversation that yields those, uh, those insights about where you should be focusing next? Yeah, um, you know, it, it is it is not a, uh, a simple process. Um, when we originally kicked off um, what we call mission related investments at the Ford Foundation, we looked at 50 or 60 possible areas, social problems, and then started asking ourselves, you know, all these problems are really important, but what are the problems where we can find uh, investment fund managers in private equity, venture capital, where uh, there's a demonstrated record of success uh, investing in companies that help address problems and make money. And so we narrowed down uh, our list when we kicked off in, in 2017, we narrowed down the list to two areas. Um, and, and since that time, we've added three more. And it all boils down to the learnings we have from being out in the field, uh, understanding the social problems and finding those investment fund managers we can commit capital to who will leverage our capabilities and our resources uh, to, to make the world a better place. Um, I, such important work, Roy, and what a perfect note to end this conversation on, but don't go anywhere because after this break, we're going to bring all of the forward thinkers back to have a lively discussion and we will be pulling in questions from hashtag Princeton Forward on social media. So if you're watching, please, uh, please tweet and send in those questions. Um, let's hear first from Professor Dalton Conley on his team's explorations of something called costly signaling theory and what it means for the way we all evaluate information online. Most people have had the experience of choosing a five-star rated product or service and being sorely disappointed. Putting aside the issues of bots and people paid to do ratings, there's a fundamental problem with rating systems. People just click through, give you the, everyone five stars for the sake of ease. We developed a new online rating widget that actually makes it harder for the respondent to give a high or a very low rating. This turned out to yield information that was much more accurate about the true quality. 
our innovation was very straightforward. We replaced the simple point and click on a given number of stars approach with a slider. The further out you go on either end, the widget slows down. So if you really want to give 100% rating to someone, it takes you quite a long time. Costly signaling theory is an idea that came out of ecology. For example, take the case of the peacock tail. All those beautiful long feathers signal to a potential mate that they are indeed a very strong choice. Humans are no exception. If it costs more to give a star, only the people who really care to give that rating because they're so impressed by the product are gonna spend their valuable time. We're excited by the potential of our widget to help e-commerce sites that rely on customer ratings. We think it can go beyond that and that such a system will help e-governance and basically any online forum that relies on user feedback and ratings. I'm now joined by all four of our forward thinkers, Roy, Karen, Micah, and Richard. Such fascinating conversations, and I'm so excited to have you all here in one screen. Um, I want to start with you, Karen, since you were the first of the four interviews, uh, and ask you to reflect on what, what Roy was just talking about, the idea that if you could find solutions that have an outsized impact, that is really crucial to advancing, advancing change, especially necessary societal change. Right, and I, it's something that we, we struggle with and it's why we do what we do. It's, it's an amazing challenge and opportunity. Uh, I, if, if I take an example, which is probably the best way to go through it, um, there's a project called Tidal uh, at X, which is a project that is aiming to protect the ocean and preserve uh, the ability to feed our world sustainably. There are 3 billion people in the world that get their food through primarily through fish. Uh, and, and shellfish. And uh, right now our oceans are in danger of, uh, of, of, of severe environmental uh, disarray. And so we uh, really wrestled with that and um, started thinking, well, wild fishing um, is harming the environment, but yet people need, to, fish has a generally lower carbon footprint than, than other meats. And uh, we have these 3 billion people that are relying on this. So we started thinking about, okay, well, if you do fish farming, that also has nutritional issues and disease and sort of also environmental disruption. We went out in the field and we started talking with folks um, about what, what worked and what didn't. And again, just imagined that we saw the process was highly manual and really difficult and labor intensive and wasteful. We thought, okay, so what if they didn't have to take the fish out of the water to weigh them? What if they could automatically just feed them the same way that we do wild fishing when fish found their food? What would that look like? How would we test that? And so we um, said, well, what if we created like facial recognition for fish where we could and, and weigh the fish just by looking at it with an underwater camera and machine learning and how would we do that and so one of the first times I was there uh, you know I, I started out at X so I literally was like how do we get a pool in here does anybody know how we get a pool in here to test this and so we uh, started out testing in a pool with some fish and a camera and some um, machine learning algorithms again really rough but it taught us so much and then went out to the field and really understood um, what it would mean with, uh, with real people and their, their real issues uh, and kept iterating. And uh, we've got a ways to go from there, but it's really exciting to see it in, in the field right now, literally in the water. Karen, your lab sounds so cool. I want to visit your lab. <laughs> Post-COVID, I'm fascinated. Absolutely. <laughs> well, I, I also, I, I just want to add that uh, when it comes to Alphabet or Google, I always get them confused. Uh, just a, an extra shout out to them because Google Ventures, uh, which is the internal uh, investment arm, is, is, is also looking at this question of access to capital uh, for, for more people uh, to help um, advance uh, economic equality for people of all uh, races and, and, and women. So, uh, you know, Google Alphabet is really uh, helping to advance many fields. So, so I, I'm just a shout out for that. 
And I have to point out that all of you are in one way or another working to help humanity, to, um, to raise awareness and, and, and drive solutions for environmental and social issues. And I, of course, have to think about the, the Princeton motto in the service of the nation and, and in the service of all nations, in the service of humanity, and uh, would love any thoughts on how, in your experience, in your exploration of these fields, things that you have learned that you would want others to, to take to heart about ways that we can all apply our, our different expertise. Um, and Roy, for you, I mean, you, you came from the world of finance and you always wanted to do something that would be helpful, but maybe this was not exactly what you'd originally anticipated, but how you think about, um, about using your, your expertise as a force for good. Well, um, I, I, I'm reminding a bit of, of, of what some of what Michael was talking about. Um, uh, you know, the, the need to give 200% when you really uh, want to go after something that's, that's very important and the need to be, to be fearless. Um, and, um, and, and, and what I, what I find in, in the world of investment and, and finance is there, there's just a lot of tradition. And I mentioned the term, um, how do we disrupt pattern recognition and it's really hard to uh, go against the crowd. There's a perceived safe way of doing things, uh, but at the same time, there's another way of doing things that could benefit not only the investor, but, but all of society. So one of the things that I'm doing that is in line, I'm a failed pre-med just to, uh, uh, to, to, to out myself, uh, but my goal was to try to find work where, um, where I could uh, apply um, uh, my expertise uh, and, and make money uh, while, while helping others in, in as tangible way as, as, as possible. And I think there is, there is a way to, uh, to use capital uh, to, to advance uh, society and make money. But, but it's, it's, um, um, there, there's some cognitive bias that I think is, has set up a wall uh, that has to be climbed. So I'll, I'll stop there. Micah, do you want to want to respond to that and this idea of maybe um, throwing out the established way of doing things to have the biggest impact? Yeah, I think that. Okay, you were failed pre med. I was a failed Woody Woo, um, so <laughs> that that didn't happen for me there. And I actually got into Princeton off the wait list, so top that, everybody. Wow. <laughs> Um, Dean Hargadon called me on my graduation day from high school and said, um, we have a space I need to know in 12 hours. So there you have it. Um, yeah, I guess maybe that those were the early seeds of giving it your all. And I think the thing about innovation and exploration is that sometimes you don't know where you're ultimately going to end up, right? And it's what Karen was saying about solving the hardest thing first or the projects that fail that suddenly inform something different. And you have to be willing to be in the kind of like that squishy middle space. I used to talk about it about like when you have a loose tooth and it hurts and it feels good. Like when people like doing that mentally um, and physically, they're a good team member for me um, and for the work that I'm trying to do because you're always exploring the hurt and feel good. Um, and if you're willing to do that, then you can get to those bigger leaps. But it's 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 rarely linear. And I think that sometimes when we talk about this, you can go backwards and explain the, you know, how it was linear in hindsight. But when you're moving forward, it doesn't feel linear. It just feels like this deep drive um, to be able to keep putting the pieces together. You know, and, and that's the example for me of saying, I thought we were going head first towards all these other mountains that we we're going to work in. And then we did this big pivot and COVID was part of it. And it's like, holy cow, this doesn't have to sit in the mountains. This has incredible application across any biodiversity area in the entire world. So let's go bigger. And Richard, and I of, see your, sorry, sorry, go ahead, Karen. I was gonna say part of what you hit on there, which I love is this sense of being open to learning and to being curious about what's around. So you're seeing the opportunities that are coming your way. Because if you had been so focused on the milestone or the goal of the mountain, you would have missed all of the opportunity for the larger, uh, greater impact and, and scope. Um, along with that though comes what you talked about, that discomfort, that squishiness. And I don't know, I always, it's, it's that comfort in that, discomfort. It's that, yeah, we're here in the squishy zone. We know it's tough. I'm not sure what's going to happen here, but all right, how do we get through this? And you're not alone. You're with a team, all of whom have 
hopefully these diverse perspectives and um, stories and empathy with you to, to move it forward to reach that goal. And, and that's what's just so exciting and um, just incredibly satisfactory about it uh, to see the progress. Richard, I want to bring you in here. I see your your openness to exploring in your in your reporting that I admire so much. Um, and I want to make sure you get to ask Micah about her her climbing as someone who has has put together those ropes yourself. Well, thank you. Um, actually, uh, I, I'd actually like to. I want to tell a little story, and I also want to address my question to all of my fellow panelists. Um, and it's the it's the question of fear. Um, and people who engage in exploration of any kind um, have to manage fear and you can't get rid of fear. It's always there. And, um, and it can be, it can take many forms. It can take uh, the form of fear of your own death or the death of somebody on your team. Uh, but it can also be fear of failure. Um, that's a big thing with me. I, I think there is a truth in the statement that all writers are failed writers because <laughs> what you write, when you see it, when it's finally in print, you go, oh, this is nowhere near as good as I, it really should have been. <laughs> Look head. at all these mistakes. This is a mess. And now it's been published and I can't do anything about it. Um, it's a, fear of failure is a big deal. And also fear of mediocrity, of just doing an okay job. You know, if you're, if you're pushing the envelope in your career and whatever you most hope to accomplish, um, the, the, it's the fear of not quite getting to the top. Um, and so the story is, um, so when I was researching the hot zone, I really wanted to go face to face with Ebola virus in level four hot zone lab at the army. Finally talked my way in there. And I was brought in with, by two researchers, Joan and Tom. And uh, I had to put on a space suit, learn how to do that. And it was an army suit. It was actually a loner as I found out later. Uh, so now we're in, we're in the hot zone and they were working with um, an unknown X virus. It had been uh, recovered from the blood of a, a person, a man who was evidently a member of the US intelligence community who had died with blood streaming out of all the orifices of his body in location in the Middle East. And there was a concern that this was an assassination by let's say the Russians. And uh, so I'm in there now. And Tom said, would you like to see the, the virus cultures in the microscope? And I'm like, yeah, sure. So I bent over this microscope and I'm looking through and I've got this face plate on, you know, and I'm kind of trying to look into the, uh, into the eyepieces and my spacesuit was pressurized. And all of a sudden the suit lost pressure. I could feel it sort of collapse around me and I go like, no, oh, there's something wrong here. And I looked down, I couldn't see anything. So with my spacesuit gloves, I began clutching around and I found that I was I was feeling my surgical scrubs underneath my spacesuit. My spacesuit had exploded and torn open in level four in the presence of this virus. So like, you know, what am I supposed to do here? You know, I don't know, what's the procedure? And I just stood up and I turned to Tom and I, I showed him my hanging suit and I said, do I have a problem? And there was this look on his face like, yeah. And he rushed at me and he closed my suit up. The zipper had popped open. He closed it all up and then I repressurized. And he said, now you don't. So, you know, what do you do? I mean, I, mean, I the only thing I could do, I mean, I could have started screaming and begged to be taken out, but that wasn't gonna do any good because, you know, I probably had a virus inside my suit getting friendly with me, I don't know. So, but it's these, you know, it's these, you know, you, you have to face things like this and you have to deal with it somehow. And so my question initially was for Micah, like, how do you deal with fear of heights? Um, how do you deal when you're mountaineering and you're in a, a situation where you make a mistake and you could die or somebody on your team could die? How do you manage that fear? What do you do? But the yeah, question applies for, to anybody. I think for me, at this point in my life, I recognize that I've gotten more comfortable with fear. I know that it's always going to be there. And, and then what I need to do is understand the fear in the moment. What does this mean for me today? How real is it? Am I afraid for a very, very valid reason? Am I afraid because I had a horrible night of sleep? Am I afraid, you know, what if I, you know, right now it's ice climbing season where I live in New Hampshire. So I'm constantly out ice climbing and mixed climbing. 
if I make the wrong choice here, can I die? Am I going to get very hurt? Am I going to show up for dinner? Like, what is the, you know, I kind of do this constant calculus. So I've become more comfortable with fear. And I've also been able to understand, you know, when it's real and when there are really giant consequences, then I make choices differently in response to it. And that's how I've dealt with fear. And I can have the same like pit in my stomach and like just sweaty mess from my armpits when I'm climbing as when I'm in the, like about to give a speech, when I'm about to like go approach a new funder. Um, all of those things can play ball. And again, like I try to orient myself and say, what is, you know, what does failure look like and what are the consequences of failure? And then I, tr and I work to align myself based on that. And, you know, the great thing is when I'm out climbing, maybe 15% of the time, it's the, the fear is in my head, but about 85% of the time, I'm afraid for damn good reason. And it means I need to make a different choice. And I used to be really headstrong about that when I was younger. Um, and I'm a mom, and I'm still a pro climber. And I plan on having both of those things continue for decades to come. So I have uh, a lot of choices that I make these days. So um, Richard, I'm glad you asked that question. It was intended to be my very last one about sort of the value of fear and understanding how to balance fear and the cost of not being a, a, an explorer and not taking risks. Because it sounds like, I get that's a little bit about the, the way you think about it. But I would love to hear from you, Richard, as well as from Karen and Roy, as we wrap things up about how not only do you manage fear, but how do you use fear as an advantage to drive your work? I would love to hear Karen. Um, because I was thinking you, you, you have worked out a procedure for dealing with fear, um, it, the fear of failure. You know, you, you, get, you have a way of sort of celebrating it. And with Roy, I mean, what, you know, you're, you're out there probing, um, trying to find a, a leverage point, you know, like, uh, like what Archimedes said, you know, give me a long enough lever and I can move the earth. Um, but, you know, there have to be in the in you know in the process of experimentation there have to be failures i mean or 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 you're not pushing the system hard enough so how do you deal with that i don't know i i, I sort of am asking another question but i hope that's all right I think when you're able to design these experiments uh, i mean I, I i think you know in comparison um you know, uh, to certain death versus an algorithm not working. Like, I, I think we're good, you know, here. <laughs> um, uh, but when we, we design experiments to try to uh, de-risk as much as possible, to, to face the fear of the project not working. And if it, what can we learn from it rather than how, what if it doesn't work? Um, and then in the case of, uh, and then we, we try to test out in the real world again in, in ways in which uh, we can fail comfortably. Uh, so with a minimal impact, uh, the way technology is now, we can simulate so much and learn from those different simulations and scenarios before we, we move into the real world. And then observing and talking to people uh, about things we might not have considered and incorporating that in. So kind of really learning as much as possible, as quickly as possible, uh, and keeping that mindset of growth and flow and um, experimentation is just critical to then achieving what, what you want. I think just from a personal perspective, as well as from a career perspective. We only have one minute left. So we're going to go to Roy and then Richard will end with you. You'll have to tell us about your own management of your fear, but Roy, you first. Yeah. So real quickly, um, I was able to choose my environment. So I chose to go to the to, to interview and go to the Ford Foundation. And during that process, I had extensive discussions with the trustees and senior management. And there were really three principles that I thought they um, agreed with. One is uh, learn as you go and share as you learn. Uh, the second is better is good. And the third is don't let perfect be the enemy of the good. And, and, and essentially um, that environment means that um, uh, failure is not a, a, a death sentence. And, and I agree with Karen, you know, for us, it's like we didn't hit our, you know, the returns we're trying to achieve as opposed to we've lost our lives. So I'll stop there and turn it over to Richard. And Richard, tell us your, your approach to managing fear. Uh, how do you use it as fuel as opposed to having it put out, put out your, uh, your fire and your, your instinct to keep exploring? Well, just in terms of that spacesuit story. So 
I was working on a, a long passage in which Colonel Nancy Jacks got blood inside her spacesuit. And, um, and then she was in the chemical shower in this airlock for seven minutes thinking about what this meant for her. Um, and I found myself inadvertently in the same situation. I'm, you know, I'm now exiting, my suit is closed up um, and I'm in the chemical shower. And I know perfectly well that if something got into my suit, um, the chemical shower isn't gonna do any good. Um, and so ultimately it, it enabled me to, I, I hope, um, get a little bit closer into the mind of Colonel Nancy Jacks when she was in a moment of, of real deep fear and, um, and somehow turn that into a piece of writing that, that could convey her own inner state. And I didn't write about in the book, The Hot Zone, I didn't write about my own experience uh, in The Hot Zone. I, I left it out completely because this was about Nancy Jacks, it wasn't about me. But there was that value in, in uh, experiencing that fear yourself. Uh, and certainly value in all four of your explorations of your respective fields. I am so grateful for all four of you joining us today. I wish I had so much more time to continue these conversations, uh, but I wanna thank you so much. I, I'm sad that we're out of time and I hope to see you all in person soon. And I'm so grateful for Princeton for organizing this uh, fascinating conversation. Thank you and thank you all for your forward thinking. Thank you, Julia. Thank you so much. Thanks, Julia. Thank you for engaging in this Forward Fest. Be sure to keep the conversation going on social media with hashtag Princeton Forward and visit forwardthinking.princeton.edu to access more forward thinking content, including downloadable resource guides for this and each month's Forward Fest that will help you dive deeper into the ideas discussed. Until next time, keep up the forward thinking.